and it went all right, um, I would say. Uh, there were no nasty surprises, and particularly, and it was a civil discussion. Um, whether it was a productive discussion or not is, is a different matter, but it wasn't an unproductive discussion, and so that's something. But there was one question that came up, and I thought I would actually start talking about that question tonight, because I've never been happy, I've been asked this question a lot, and I've never been happy with the answer that I've given to it, and I've never really been able to exactly get my, I, I've never been able to figure out exactly why I haven't been happy with the question. And so, I'm going to try to answer it properly tonight, and then I'm going to talk more generally about 12 rules about the book. Now, it's fine, this question is directly relevant to the book, and so it should make for a good lead-in, but it'll enable us to talk about something that I think is really very much worth talking about, and I hope I can formulate the problem properly, and then formulate the proper answer, at least more coherently than I've managed. It's, see, I, ha I have this, this I followed this rule for a very long time, which I actually found w was a Socratic rule. I didn't know this until, really quite recently, until I wrote 12 Rules for Life. Socrates said that he had a, a daemon, and by which he meant an internal voice. And um, he said that it all, he always listened to it, and then that was what made him different from other people, that he always listened to this voice. And the voice didn't tell him what to do, it told him what not to do. And um, when the Delphic Oracle proclaimed that Socrates was the wisest man in Greece, um, in Athens, and in Greece, uh, one of the reasons Socrates attributed her decision to deem him the wisest man was because well, she said he knew he knew nothing, but he knew in part that he knew nothing, at least in part because he was always listening to the voice of his daemon, his internal conscience. And then I just found out the other day that the word democracy comes from the same root, which is really interesting. Like, I, I had no idea that that was the case, because what it suggests, it's, 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 it's so fascinating looking at how words are related to one another historically, because you find strange connections between ideas that you would never imagine, and sometimes they're unbelievably profound. And so, the, the basic, what happened historically is that, well, so, there was the concept of the Socratic daemon. Now, it was the daemon that Socrates listened to when he decided that he was not going to run when the Athenians decided that they were going to put him to death the Athenian aristocrats, right? Because they thought that he was corrupting the youth by, you know, talking to them and telling them the truth. And I suppose that's certainly grounds for chasing someone out of your town. Um, anyways, they gave him plenty of notice because they didn't really want to kill him. They just wanted to get the old goat, the hell, out to some other city where he could cause trouble there. And he, his friends were, you know, making plans to, to scurry him away from Athens. Um, and he went out and consulted his daemon, and it told him not to leave. And that was a big shock to Socrates, because, of course, he didn't want to die. And, uh, but yet, he had decided that he was always going to follow the dictates of the daemon. And he, um, so he did something that only a philosopher would do, was reversed his assumptions. He thought, oh, well, I was afraid of dying, and my daemon said, stick around, and so I must be wrong. It must be worse to be, to risk not following that internal voice than to risk this form of death, you know, which is a question you have to really wrestle with, and one his, friend, one his friends weren't very happy about, but in any case, he didn't run, and we have two good court-like documents attesting to that, one written by someone named Xenophon, and the other by Plato. They're very interesting documents. I would highly recommend reading them. They're very short, and the reason, one of the reasons I would recommend reading them, apart from the fact that they're fascinating and, and, and short, is that you, you also get the sense from, from what Socrates wrote that because he had lived his life fully, you know, no holds barred in some sense, that he could let it go when the time came. 
And, and that's an interesting thing, you know, because, well, it's a question I think that we all wrestle with, we should, is like, well, is there a purpose to our life? And, well, that's a hard question. And then, if there is a purpose, well, how is it expressed? And then, if there is a purpose and our lives are truncated, as they are, by death, then how can that purpose have significance? And those are hard questions. But Socrates' experience seemed to be that he had lived enough in his life so that when push came to shove, which it certainly did, he was able to gracefully let it go. And that's... And, you know, he attested to that with his death. And, and, and that's fairly convincing, you know. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's a fairly convincing argument. And it's one that I find... Well, it's hard to tell if I find it exactly credible, but I, I don't find it incredible. I mean, I, I certainly have noticed that as I've got older and have done things, various... I've, 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 what would you say? Accomplished isn't exactly the right word. I've participated in many things that I'm pleased to have participated in them, but wouldn't necessarily go back and participate in them again. It's sort of as if when you do something and you finish it, it's as if it's done. You don't have to do it again. And maybe it's possible, who knows, that if you finish your life, whatever that might mean, if you exhaust your life, then then that's enough life, you know, that, that, that you've had enough. And, I mean, that doesn't mean that I try not to keep myself healthy and that I want to die tomorrow. It doesn't mean any of that. I'm trying to stick around as long as I can. But, but, but there's still that, that, that curiosity about the relationship between life and mortality and, and the possibility that a life well lived exhausts itself in some fundamental sense, so that you can be satisfied, let's say, with, with, what you, with what you were. There is some psychological evidence that bears on this. If you ask people what they regret, um, especially as they get older, what they generally report is things not done. So they don't regret so much mistakes they've made, although, of course, people obviously regret mistakes they've made as well. So they don't exactly regret sins of commission, right? Errors that they've actively made. They, they miss, they, 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 they torment themselves for opportunities that had presented themselves that they did not, let's say, exploit or engage in. And I think that's worth thinking about, too, because one thing that I have become convinced about with regards to human consciousness, um, which I think is equivalent to the spark of divinity in some sense that our fundamental stories insist has been placed within us, is that human consciousness is that faculty that confronts potential itself I think there's good neurological evidence for this, by the way, for those of you who are scientifically minded, because uh, we build circuits within us for habitual action that we've practiced many times that seem to run in a very deterministic fashion. And we are a strange combination of deterministic and non-deterministic, as far as I can tell. But what our consciousness seems to be for is to encounter those things that we have not yet encountered. And those things that we have not yet encountered seem to me to be those things that have not yet been brought into being. And so you could say that what our consciousness is for is for the encounter with potential. You know, that our consciousness is for the... It's not for the past. It's not even for the present. It's to transform the future into the present. And, and really that that's what our consciousness does. When you wake up in the morning, you have a new day ahead of you, and the day could take you in very many directions. And, and the weeks and the years, all of that can take you in very many directions. And you have some apprehension about what those directions might be. You have some apprehension about what role your choices might make in transforming that potential into one form of 
actuality or another. I mean, you certainly know that there are dreadful mistakes that you might be very tempted to make that would produce all manner of hell around you and still be tempted to do it. It seems like it's sitting there right in front of you as a possibility. You also know that, you know, you could haul yourself up out of bed and attend to your duties and do the sorts of things that you're supposed to and set a few things right that day and that week and that likely things would at least not be worse and they would probably be better and uh, I, I believe that, I do believe that I, I don't understand how this can be the case I don't understand how it is that consciousness, consciousness can function in that way because I think to understand that we would have to understand what it means for the future to be only potential rather than actuality and who the hell understands that I mean no one and then we'd have to understand how it is that our conscious choices and our conscious ethical choices transform that potentiality into actuality into reality into the present and the past and we certainly well, we certainly act as if we believe that that's what we do. We upbraid ourselves, for example, when we do a bad job of it, we're upset with our children and those we love if we don't believe that they're living up to their potential. We're guilty and ashamed when we make choices that we feel are inappropriate. We understand to some degree that the manner in which time lays itself out has something to do with the ethics of our choice. And again, I would say that's a very deep idea. I think it's a, I think it's, I think it's the most true idea I know. It's very emphasized that idea emphasized in ancient religious stories such as those that are outlined in Genesis or in Genesis with its strange insistence that you know God is that which brings order out of chaos, formless potential, generates the world out of formless potential, and that we're somehow made in that image. Which, which seems to me to be the case. And that the proper way, by the way, to go about acting in that image is to act in relationship to the potential that confronts you with truth and with courage, with careful articulation. That's the logos. And that if you do that, then what you bring forth is, is good. So anyways, those are all background ideas that are associated with 12 Rules for Life, and they have a bearing on this question that I want to answer tonight. And so I'm going to sit. I, I have some notes, which I don't usually use, but I'm going to use them tonight because I haven't...